25 days to complete the capture of Saipan in one of the most significant battles of the Pacific. After a four-day bombardment, the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions and the 27th Infantry landed at a Jinjin point. Their first objective was a Slito airfield. The capture of a Slito airfield, renamed Isley Field in honor of an American flyer, gave us an air base less than 1,500 miles from Japan. But the rest of Saipan was yet to be taken. And as the Japs retreated into the caves and ravines of the mountainous interior, the going got plenty tough. We threw every kind of punch we had in beating the Japs back across the island. 12 and 16 inch naval guns offshore added terrific firepower to the attack of the land forces. As yard by yard, we gained Mount Tapachau and then swarmed down on Garapan. As the Japs were compressed in the northeast tip of the island, they staged a counterattack of fanatical violence. But the counteroffensive burned out quickly. And by the 15th of the month, the last defenses were overcome. When it was all over, 16,000 Japs had been killed. They owed life cheaply. And there were a lot of them. 1,000, however, were taken prisoner, more than usual. And so Saipan was cleaned up. This is a part of the Pacific fight that you won't find in the headlines. This is a battle you won't see in the newsreels. For this is the ordinary fight of ordinary soldiers, sailors, and Marines. A struggle to establish bases and airfields to launch the next offensives. It's a battle against insects, hunger, and being tired. It's not eight or ten, but twelve hours a day. And no extra pay for overtime. This could be home, except that here the deadlines are more urgent. There are no Sundays as we know them, for an airstrip must be rolled out of this Pacific jungle, and the longer it is delayed, by just so much is the day of victory prolonged. The boys that put up this control tower were engineers, used to comfortable offices, easy hours, but no more. This is a different tempo of life, where hours and minutes can account for casualties and deaths. At best, the coral airstrips of the Pacific are tough on tires, for planes land fast, hard, and often. Tire and engine changes must be made quickly, for every moment counts in the drive across the island seas. There is a heavy transport, loaded with spares and much-needed supplies. And something even better. Yes, sir, it's a Navy nurse. Behind that smile is a hypodermic full of typhoid shots. But who cares now? Here are previously unreleased pictures of the Hamp, one of Japan's most efficient light fighters. A zero-type plane, it is one of the fastest and most maneuverable enemy planes in the Pacific. The droppable fuel tank was first developed by the Japs in the war with China. It gave them more distance and forced us to make some quick design changes to get similar tanks on our fighters. Sleek and fast, it is nevertheless vulnerable because it does not carry self-sealing fuel tanks. The absence of this protection is explained by Lieutenant Colonel Joe Renner Marine aviator recently returned from the Pacific. The reason these Jap planes are so fast and maneuverable is because the Japs consider performance more important than the pilots' lives. They achieve this performance by leaving out armor plate and self-sealing tanks. But our aircraft can carry the extra weight and still outperform anything the Japs have to offer. Thanks to our superior designers and builders, Americans today are building the finest aircraft in the world. There is no doubt about that. By contrast, here is one of the best protected, most deadly aircraft yet developed. The Navy's new dive bomber, the Helldiver. 
Made by Curtis Wright, Fairchild, and Canadian Car and Foundry, it is also the product of many contributing plants all over the country. The outer panel comes from Hudson, the center panel from Chrysler, the turtle back from Procter & Schwartz, the speed ring from Woodall Industries. These are just a few of the plants to whom the Navy owes tribute for the best, fastest carrier-based dive bomber in service today. with the now familiar lineup of overwhelming force standing offshore ready for action. For 17 days without letup, the island defenses were bombed from the air and pounded by gunfire from ships offshore. The force included most of the 5th Fleet and ships of the 3rd Amphibious Group. Air cover and air attack was provided by carrier-based fighters and dive bombers. Phosphorus shell bursts on shore in the midst of the defending Japs. The landing craft rendezvous, and then in a long line streak for the shore. the shore defenses ahead of the landing craft. We too pay a heavy price as two amphibious tanks are hit squarely in the assault. of the capture of the Marianas was apparent even before the retaking of Guam. A week after the capture of Saipan, it was announced that Admiral Shimada was relieved as Commander-in-Chief of the Japanese Navy. And two days later, Tojo and his war cabinet resigned. But as Tojo himself said in announcing the loss of Saipan, the real battle is going to be fought from now on. A poster distributed to the workers in Japanese production plants reads, This is a war of production. The Americans are soft. We who have learned to live the hard way shall triumph through persistence. We are strong. We are determined. To such sentiments, Tojo added the words, There is not a single grain of delusion in us. And there is not the slightest hesitation in our eyes in facing death and life. That is what we have to fight. 